You know, I could have introduced practically every speaker simply by reading his description put out by the Southern Poverty Law Center. <laughs> it would be amusing, but not very informative. In fact, the opposite of informative for the most part. But I did think, uh, uh, in the case of Ramsey Paul, I would refer to uh, what the SPLC says about him. They, they call him a smirking video blogger. <laughs> now, now I, I wish the worst thing they said about me that was that I was a smirker. But then they go on, they go on to quote a, a, some Canadian, oddly enough, a nameless Canadian, who then says, he positions himself as a satirist. He doesn't spew hate speech, hate speech indiscriminately. So it takes a few minutes to figure out that he's in fact a racist. You know? <laughs> That's just the worst kind. It takes you a few minutes to unmask them as a racist. All right, please welcome Ramsey Paul. Hey, can I, can I carry it this like this? This is cool. I can walk around. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the first thing I have, does anyone have seen my speech, my notes? I, I did lose them beforehand, so I'm going to have to improv. I think as an SPLC spy, they always have one in here, and I think they stole my notes. But that's not going to stop me, so I'm going to go forward. So. so how many people have seen my videos? Oh, geez. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's funny, as uh, um, Jared asked me to speak last year, and I got his email, and I'm like, well, that's not Jared Taylor, because Jared Taylor wouldn't ask me to speak, but it was him. I'm like, well, Jared, have you really watched my videos? You know, I mean, I'm not you know, that educated or that sophisticated, but he asked me, so I spoke, and then about, I, it's like sex and nationalism, I think I did a, a like a penis joke to start out the conference, so was, but they invited me back, so... It's good to be here, and um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, who's Ramsey Paul? My, gem my I'm born June 7th, and um, who's here Gemini's? I was, I'm June 7th, yeah. Uh, one of the things about Gemini's, we don't believe in astrology, so. Uh, anyway, I have a dual character, it says here. I'm an anti-racist progressive. This was, the reason we can't talk to the uh, protesters is, I think, because of me, because I was out there last year, and I was protesting the convention. And, it, and people, they, they were looking at me funny, and I couldn't understand why. Why were people looking at me funny because of that? Can anyone see it? It's really embarrassing. I drew the swastikas backwards, and I was like, damn. <laughs> Whoa, look who's on this, the challenges report for the year in hate. Yeah, see down there in the right corner, that scary guy? That's me. <laughs> I'm like the Trayvon, white Trayvon. I'm like a gangster. Actually, I've never robbed a liquor store. I've never wore a hoodie like that. I did that in a video, and they stole that as a video still from me without my permission, and they showed me like that. But I kind of like it. I look like a Sith Lord or something like that. So. Don't I look, you know, the Star Wars, I really get that vibe there, so... And this is the next report, this is a rumor. This is my dog Dino, he was in one of my videos. And I was really shocked because he was doing a Nazi salute. So it's like, <laughs> the SPLC is proud because of diversity. This is the first time they're gonna have a non-human hater and he's my dog, <laughs> Dino. All right, who's Ramsey Paul? Well, I'm trouble. I'm just an American with a camera, that's all I am. I mean, it's just, there's nothing major about it. I'm nationalism meets uh, pop cu culture. I just look at what's in the news and I tend to, Drink a little bit, and I make a video. Uh, they're quick videos. Like I said last year, if three minutes is long enough for sex, it's long enough for a video. That's my philosophy. <laughs> so, I, Jared said I had 20,000 subs. Maybe I do now, but I was, I was like at 17,800 or something, and I, I got the six million views, so it's like another, it's another Holocaust, really, so. All right, what I support, uh, I believe that people have the right to exist. And it sounds like, well, well obvious, how, how controversial is that? But if you believe that white people should be allowed to exist, you know what you are? Racist. No, you're a Nazi, so that's... <laughs> and I, I believe people have the right to self-determination, not just white people, all people, so that, that's it, you know? But, and I think, and a lot of the speakers have talked about, I think self-determination is more than just race. I've done a lot of tra uh, traveling in Europe, but it's, it's race, it's language, it's religion, it's culture, it's more than just race. So self-determination is more than race. What it's not, it's not hating other races, it's not supremacist or hate. 
and I really don't get into the whole purity thing, you know. I mean, I, I've, and I think Derbyshire said, you know, the kind of the, we want to basically our homeland for ourselves, but it doesn't have to be 100% pure, right? So uh, that, that's kind of my philosophy with that. So, um, wait a minute, did I miss something here? The dark in uh, enlightenment. Uh, what is the dark enlightenment? It's, it's probably known as neo-reactionary. You probably have seen in it. And uh, the dark enlightenment is really the idea of, is re it's a rejection of the religion of progressivism. And um, really what that is, is it's kind of a play on words, is because in the dark ages, that was kind of a uh, propaganda thing, if you think about it, like, ooh, the dark ages and the enlightenment, everything we learned. But it's, it's like, you know, maybe not everything in the dark ages was really that bad, and we should look back to that to some, some insight. So that's really the idea of the dark enlightenment. Okay, trigger warning, this speech, I, I didn't know this. Have you guys heard of trigger warnings? It's something like, I guess, like strong, empowered feminists, they get like, oh, you can't say that because I'll, I'll just freak out. So this is a trigger warning to you that if you're like a Catholic, Protestant, Jew, hippie, Puritan, Whig, all that, just, you know, you can watch out for this speech here. So yeah, Whigs, that's, I don't know if there's any Whigs here. Is there? Okay, uh, we're all Puritans and hippies now, and I'll try to explain how this theory went in the Dark Enlightenment. Because you think the Puritans, how are they related to the hippies? They're just so different. The Puritans were uptight, the hippies were free love and everything. And I, I did like that picture of the, the hippies, though, the girl in the orange and the red. I thought that was kind of cute. You know what else is orange and red and looks good on hippies? Fire. <laughs> All right, a brief history of progressivism. Uh, all right, this is the first. It, let me let me just back up because you know everyone. I could talk about my sex life. Everyone's fine with it. I could do performance art here. Everyone's fine. But you talk about religion. Everyone's like, oh, geez, you better not go there. But yeah, I'm gonna go there. So this is it. So a little background on me, just so you know. I'm a Protestant. I was raised as a Protestant. Um, let me see, my, my mother was a Protestant, and then my parents were divorced, and she uh, married a Jewish guy, so I'm, a, I'm a familiar with the Jewish, and my stepmother was a really strong Catholic. I'm not against any religion. This isn't anti-religious, so don't, don't, you don't throw your roles at me. So anyway, the, the whole idea was uh, Martin Luther was, I consider in some ways, the first progressive. He was a Catholic monk, a monk and a Catholic priest. But he thought that the church should not be a hierarchy of clergy, but a community of believers. See, for Christ, uh, Western civilization, for really a thousand years, it was you know, God, the church, the people. And he was the first one to think, no, you know, we don't need to go through the priest to get to God. We can go directly through the scripture, or directly to um, Jesus and all that. We don't need the priest. So this was like the egalitarianism spiritually. And this has some, this really kicked off a lot of things that happened in Europe and so forth, that all Christians are part of the holy uh, priesthood. Uh, that was, this was the first guy. And then you had the uh, Puritans. And you know, when I think of the Puritans, I always, what do you think of? You think? Yeah. Yeah, I think of Thanksgiving, right? You know, the Puritan Thanksgiving, and um, which is interesting. And I asked my Jewish stepfather, he's not alive anymore, but I asked, do, do you Jews, do you celebrate Thanksgiving? And he says, no, we're Jews, so we just celebrate thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> anyway, the Puritans were opposed to the monarchy, and they really gained influence in the University of Cambridge. And many, the pilgrims, you remember, they migrated to the New England because they were kind of like the hippies of the day. They just wanted their own thing, do their own way, and they came to the new world. And they were really kind of the radical progressives of the day. I know it's funny to think of that, but that's the way it was. And then there's this guy. Boom! That's good. I didn't know we had that many neo-reactionaries. Oliver Cromwell, he, cause he was a self-styled Puritan Moses. I mean, who does that? But this guy did. Yeah, he was like the original Kingslayer. I'm not saying he has sex with his sister, but he, he killed uh, King Charles. <laughs> Most people don't understand. You had to watch Game of Thrones to understand that one. And he ruled uh, England, but this was the first time because it had the egalitarian concept, get rid of the monarchy. That was Oliver Cromwell. And then we had the American Revolution. <laughs> I know. And this is one of the things I never knew. I'm always a supporter. I'm a good American. I support the American Revolution. 
And, um, you know, because when I went to school, I went to a Christian school first, and they told us this myth that, you know, George Washington, remember when he was a little child, they said, you know, he cut down the cherry tree. You remember that story? And it was like his father came to him and said, you know, George, how did this cherry tree, you know, tree get cut down? Did you do it? And George says, I cannot tell a lie. I cut it down. And the story was he didn't get punished because he told the truth. Now, as a kid, I always thought, well, he probably didn't get punished because he's holding an axe, but... <laughs> But a lot of those stories aren't true. And I found out a lot of this whole revolution thing was, there was the Whigs, and they were, um, they kind of came out of the Puritans, they were influential in Britain, and uh, they, they believed in democracy and the whole bit, anti-monarchy. And one of the things I never understood was how General Howe was unable to defeat Washington. Because if you read about the American Revolution, the British kicked her butt every um, battle. And, but we still won. How was that? And it turned out General Howe was a Whig, and there was a lot of British that were really secretly on our side. So I think the whole war was kind of fixed, really. There wasn't really much of a concern. as like, let the Americans do whatever they want. We don't care. But then we got ideas like this, all men are created equal. That was the Declaration of Independence, by the way, not the Constitution. It was uh, Thomas Jefferson. And really, I mean, all men are equal? But this is where it started to get into the thinking. And remember, a lot of this, where, did the, where was the hotbed well, I, I, I show you there, so it's not really a fair question. But really, the revolution, I was talking to someone today, where did it really form it? It formed it in Boston and New England. That was the, uh, the, where the Puritans started. In the South, not so much. But this is where really get, we get the idea of the egalitarianism and democracy. Okay, then we have the big French Revolution. This is where it's kind of the modern day, I guess, leftist liberal as you think of it. I mean, they cut off heads, bloodletting. It was, a, it was a great time they liked it. And I'm not going to make any French jokes because the French did win this war. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, of course it's against other French, but yeah, okay. So um, They abolished the French monarchy. Again, the ideas of liberty, equality, fraternities. That's the enlightenment. That's the embody that. And the Declaration of Women's Rights, you th we think that's something in the 70s? Hell no, it went back to, I mean, heck no. That went back to the French Revolution. This was the first attack really on religion. And what I'm gonna try to show you is how this whole idea of progressivism soon became divorced from God and Christianity. And it started really kind of in this way. And eventually it resulted in the reign of terror, if you're familiar with that, where they were just chopping everyone's head off. And this is what they call in the neo-reaction zombie ac apocalypse. That means when the left just starts killing, 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 unless there's like a dictator coming in or something, everyone starts killing each other. And the reign of terror, if you read about it, it was a horrible time and Napoleon came in, ended, but this was the kind of the first precursor to a lot of things we saw here. Then of course the Russian Revolution. Uh, this, they overthrew, overthrew the Tsar and you had the whole idea of equality and social justice. And Women's Day was established in 1917. You know, you ever hear of International Women's Day? Uh, Google, they won't celebrate Easter, but boy, they celebrate International Women's Day. That was a communist holiday. I know some communists that, were, that lived in the communist countries. It was strictly a, a communist um, holiday. Homosexuality was decrim uh, decriminalized under Lenin, especially Trotsky. They kind of went back from that, but... And uh, the, one of the communist leaders, she's this lady here in Anessa, she endorsed feminism and free love. And this is where we got the whole big Soviet Union thing. It's in the news now, right? Because where they took over the Ukraine, that whole empire they have. And so it's an interesting subject. I did get a speaking engage engagement. I'm not joking. I just recently got a speaking engagement from um, right sector in the Ukraine. They want me to come to speak with them. So I may go there and talk to them. And I was talking to him, and he said, yeah, Ramsey Paul, we're really having troubles now with tourism, obviously, because, you know, the Russians and all that. So it could be risky there. But what have they done? Because they become so desperate. I don't know if you heard. It, it, Chernobyl, that's in Ukraine, and they're making that now into, like, a tourist attraction. And I'm like, oh, come on. And he goes, no, it's, it's just like Disneyland, except the six-foot mouse is real. <laughs> so I may go for that one there. All right, World War II, yay, the good war. Um, this really was a defeat of the reactionary elements. We defeated the, uh, now everyone just thinks World War II was about um, Germany, right? Nazi Germany, but we also fought, everyone forgets, we fought the Japanese. And I, I'm not against the war. My, I had relatives, true story, that actually fought in Germany. My dad has a Luger from them. That's really cool. I hope to get that one day. And my other uncle was, a uh, great uncle, was in the Japanese theater. And he actually won the Purple Heart. It was kind of sad. He got, uh, his tongue got shot out. So 
He never really spoke much about it, though. But, um, but this established the Soviet Union and the USA leaders as the leaders of the world. And really, the Soviets, they were kind of the revolutionary Marxists, you know, like overthrow, you know, Cuba, uh, North Korea, overthrow. And that's kind of the revolutionary Marxist. And the USA really kind of started the more of the cultural Marxist, which is more of not so much a class division, but what we see with race and so forth against uh, men versus women and religion against Christianity and so forth. And, um, but the USA and the Soviet Union, the important thing to remember from a neo-reactionary point of view, they really were kind of, the, their ideology of progressivism was the same. We'll get into that. I mean, they're political foes. It wasn't a conspiracy. They really kind of hated each other, but they had the same type of uh, ideology, so to speak, or theology, as I would call it. Then we have the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. Communism is dead, long live communism. It, it seemed to fall, but really at that point I saw cultural Marxism, which is one of the high gear, um, even more so than the 80s, where we saw the feminism, gay rights, multiculturalism, the attack of uh, Christianity. So, you know, went through the whole period of the Puritism and all that. By this point, the, the whole God aspect has, was jettisoned and religion, but a lot of the same qualities were there, which I'll, which I'll get into. The religion of progressivism. Uh, a religion doesn't really require a belief of God. I know you think it, I thought it did at first, but then you know, people brought up like Buddhists, they don't believe in God, but that's a religion. It's just mostly a, a firm belief that you don't necessarily have to believe in facts or science, but it's a faith. And the, the key doctrines I think we see of the progressivism to the degree that it's really religious is the equality of mankind, everyone's the same, and democracy, which kind of feeds into each other. And all major political parties really support this idea. The Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Marxists, Tea Parties, oh yeah, they, they hate each other and they come at it a different way, but they all support, yeah, man's really, we're all basically equal and democracy, everyone needs a voice. They all believe that in general. So that's kind of the religion of it. Uh, and what I call a Puritanism without God. And I grew up, again, I went to a Christian school and I was in that environment for a while. And there's really a, a nature in Christianity, if you're not familiar with it, of original sin. That means we're sinners, we're born that way, we're inherently bad people, and we need redemption because we're just evil worms and we just need to somehow, you know, get penance or purification. And I saw that when I see all this wacky stuff out there with this white guilt and those guys out there, right? They're religious. They really are. That's why they fight it. It's not political. This is a religion. And the... They turned it around that whites, men, heterosexuals, cisgenders. You guys know cisgender. Some of you guys don't know what cisgender is. Who's here is cisgender? Can I see you? I am. You're not cisgender? <laughs> cisgender means you're just the person that you're, you know, like I'm a cisgender, meaning I'm a man trapped in a man's body. That's cisgender, okay? I, you think I'm making this up. I'm not. These guys out there, that's what they, they believe in all this weird stuff. So. So if you're a man in a man's body that you have cis privilege and it's kind of weird in their point of view. So you need redemption. How do you do redemption? Well, you, you, you know, years ago you'd flog yourself, wear a hair shirt or something. Now you put markings across your face. That was a video I did called the unfair campaign where white people were encouraged to say how horrible they were because they were white and you have these conferences and really what it is is like a ritual pur purification you're trying to atone for your original sin that is so theology that I grew up with I understood it I and mean, it's, it's this exactly and the whole righteous judgment thing you know we grew up you know it's gonna be the rapture God's gonna come he's unhappy with us he's gonna punish your evil humans that happens with the leftists now and global warming and I, I Global warming, do you guys know this? this? This is the leading cause of documentaries in the United States. So it's, it's a very dangerous thing. But you have the whole doomsday cult, you know, like we're just evil people, we're all gonna die and we deserve it because we're white and evil. And, and that's, that's what those guys are. And I never understood that, but it's the religious feeling they really have. Okay, the, the neo-reactionaries are in the dark enlightenment. You hear something called the cathedral. And they don't mean it in a religious sense, so don't be offended if you're Catholic, Protestant, or whatever. I, I'm a Protestant. Not, it's not meant to be that. But what the cathedral is, is an organic collection of major universities like Harvard, Yale. No offense, Jared. But, um, and the media and the government to, to promote the doctrine and to punish heresy. 
And the difference between heresy and aberrant ideas, I mean, again, I lost my darn notes. Someone stole them, so I'll have to do this off the top of my head. But, for example, let's say the race issue, and you see difference of racial performance between, let's say, blacks and whites, or blacks and Asian, right, or blacks and Jews. The, the orthodox position, uh, position with liberals is, well, the reason is, is because of centuries of white racism, and they're put down, and they, they weren't given it a chance, so you gotta understand, that's why we can explain that. That's the orthodox position. Now, the aberrant position, which is tolerated, but it's the, the, the liberals were considered this aberrant, is like what the Tea Party would say, the Republicans. What would the Republicans say to that? There's like, well, no, the reason we see the difference is because, you know, big government needs to get off the back of the, the you know, the black folks. That's what's really causing the problems. We have these welfare programs, we whatever. We just have, I think Jack Kemp was like, let's have an enterprise tax zone in ghettos, and man, they're just gonna explode productivity and so forth. So that's an aberrant. The liberals would disagree with that and say, boo, Republicans. But they both came, they both have the same thing, Republicans and Democrats, so all mankind is equal. But they just approach it as a different reason why that could be. But heresy is like, well, maybe not everyone is equal. You know, I mean, it's just possible. And that's like, well, wait a minute, that's, that's going against, that's getting religious at that point. And it, when people, you violate the religion, they get very angry, let's just say, like Muslims or Christians used to be that way. Or, but those, those guys, right? They, that's a religious feeling they have. And, that's, and they may not believe in God and they may hate God and hate Christianity, but they're very religious people. Okay, the heresy hunters. Um, this is like the SPLC and all those people, right? Um, they, they're... They're like the witch hunters back in the Puritan times for they look to find heresy and punish heresy. You gotta understand, they don't think they're bad guys. They think that the reason things aren't working out or is because, well, you guys, you're stopping things from working out, damn it. And so if they can just get rid of the heretics, we'll have this egalitarian system. So when they go out and search for witches or modern day term for witches is racist or whatever, they're, that's how they're thinking, that's their mindset. And you know, they're called counter-revolutionaries, haters, supremacists, whites, but it's the same type of thing. It really comes from that Puritan mindset of, you know, we have a crop failure. Well, it's because of that girl, you know, she talked about black hat. And that's, that's their thinking is of why things go bad. And how they punish it is obviously, they try social mostly, right? If you, if you think of an idea that is not approved by the herd, well, you're an outcast, you're a loser, you're a weirdo. Let's say I kind of am, but th th that's how they try to push you. Then they try to do economic. Like, if we do this, you'll lose your job. You'll be like Mel Gibson, right? He made that movie and it's like Passion of Christ. Like, well, fine, you do that. You're not going to make another film again, which he hasn't. So that's how they can try to do certain positions. Uh, you know, in Britain, you know, there's that guy. I couldn't believe it, how bad Britain is. This guy made a joke about Nelson Mandela. Said, if you guys saw that, he said, my computer is so slow to shut down. I'm going to rename it Man Nelson Mandela. Okay. Kind of a stupid joke, but he put it on Twitter and it's like, no, the police got involved with that. I'm like, but Britain looks like North Korea now. I'm not sure much of the difference really between the two. <laughs> and then you have the, you know, the gulags and the Soviet Union. And um, I don't have my notes, so I'll just improvise. But if you guys ever go to uh, Budapest, there's the House of Terror Museum, which is fascinating. What it is, it's an old secret uh, police building they had in Budapest where the communists used to take dissidents and they would torture them, put them in cells and execute them. Um, it, it's really fascinating. So if you do that, you could just see how really the evil and how they think about that. When they get in this mode, they just start killing everyone that they disagree with. All right, part of the thing is, is that the right always loses, right? You always lose because Conservatives, they just lag behind really what liberals are, and that's starting to become quicker and quicker and quicker. And for example, civil rights. If you're a good Republican, you think Martin Luther King is the greatest man to ever lived. You know, that's if you're a Republican, what you're gonna say now, when years ago they didn't support that. Gay marriage, that's just something that just astounds me. Just in 2008, Barack Obama was opposed to gay marriage. And now, if you, you know, disagree with gay marriage, you're like a total heretic. And you remember that whole Mozilla thing? And, um, you know, so in the future, the Republicans now are going to be like, you know, it, it keeps going to the left, right? 
So I'm sure that the Democrats will support, you know, marriage between um, polygamy or with animals. And then you'll see the uh, Republicans say, damn it, no, we support the sanctity of gay marriage and we're not going to... I can already see that, you know, they'll do the fundraiser, we must reach out to that. And that's how it always goes, it always goes to the left. And there's a reason for that, because they all have the same premise of equality and democracy. And so, because the right, so-called right, and I put it into quotes, they support all these things implicitly. They just don't understand the logical outcomes of it. Zombie apocalypse. Uh, this is where leftism leads to more leftism even faster. And we're seeing that as it gets more and more, they get more and more and more kooky. And it just gets weirder. Which is good for me, it makes easy videos. And sometimes I look at things, I'm like, is this satire? Or are they serious? And half the time, no, they're serious. And it's just crazy. And one of the things with the idea of this leftism, if it's not checked, it eventually leads to everyone killing each other because they demonstrate insufficient equality. And the Khmer Rouge was like that, right? They just huge killing fields because like, you're wearing glasses, you must be, you know, an intellectual off of your head. And that's how they get. And that's why I like those guys that are protesting, mostly white people, I'm like, do you think in, in, in the future, if we ever get total Marxist system where they just start slaughtering everyone, you could say, well, hey, I, I, I wasn't a good anti-racist, I really was. They won't care, they'll be off of your head. So it, it doesn't matter, I mean, we're, we're who we are, we gotta accept that, and being a good anti-racist is not gonna save you in the future. And the left always devours its own. They eventually just kill each other, and so, we need to stop eventually unless it's like a dictator comes in and remember the reign of terror in French Revolution, you know, Napoleon, eventually it ends into them all just slaughtering each other. Okay, the neo reaction. Uh, blue pill versus red pill. Um, this is, uh, blue pill is more of, this came from the Matrix, if you guys saw that. Who saw that movie? It was, yeah, this kind of came from that. Blue pill is if you believe in the traditional things. Uh, freedom, equality, democracy, those are all American virtues. That's a blue pill. But red pill, you know, you really become a re uh, religious heretic if you start to believe this, which I've started to do. And you always heard the phrase, you know, we conservatives want to take people back to the 50s. I said, yeah, the 1450s maybe, but that's... <laughs> the 50s were pretty really, uh, you know, already Marxist. That people really don't realize that, how that really was. So that was that it. Okay. Equality is just a total myth that I just can't get my hand around. I mean, I have two kids, so let's forget race. If you just have two kids, they're not equal. I've never seen two people are equal. And I, there's more evidence, literally, I would much believe in leprechauns before I would believe in equality. It's because there could be leprechauns. I've never seen one, but I'm 99.1999999% sure there's no leprechauns, but there could be. But equality, I see all the, everyone's different, you know, that's just how it is. And I met an I, a guy from Ireland here and, and I asked him, do, do, are there still ignorant and suspicious, um, superstitious people in Ireland that believe in leprechauns? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we, we call them American tourists, so. Uh, let's see here. Okay, equality, but this all, this drives everything. Racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, whatever because of a, a lack of equality. But if you understand that people are different, like the NFL, the reason there's probably not women in the NFL is not because of some patriarchy, it's because there's differences, okay? Let's just accept that. Or why is, I'm 50 years old. Do you think there's gonna be a 50 year old guy in the NFL? No, because hey, I admit it, I wish I was 20 again, but when you get older, you get a little slower and everything. That's just the way life is. And there's biological differences between the races and we saw that today and so forth. And so, but if you think your premise is that we have equality and everyone's really basically the same, then you have to de devise all these weird reasons why things aren't coming out equal. And so it's just a total myth, but that's like the religious aspect that we see right now is equality. And I remember it came back to Luther, right? Because we all have equality before God and we can all go to God. That was the spiritual equalitarianism. I'm not gonna get into religious debate, but that started the whole concept of equality. Rejection of democracy. How many of you, uh, raise of hands, who supports the end of democracy? <laughs> a lot of you guys don't get the irony of that, but okay. Um, <laughs> I trolled you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is a, a, a our, our, I know Churchill said that, you know, democracy is the best form of government, even though it's bad, but he, he said the best argument against democracy is a five minute conversation with the average voter. If you talk to the average person, it's like, geez, and you can vote, and it's, it's 
it's not really, it's not a great system, and it's, it's really a vector, uh, it was called, it means it's always expanding the state. Because, let's face it, winning elections is vote buying, both on the right and the left. You saw the Republicans, they went to Las Vegas between Sheldon Anderson, <laughs> Marie's a billionaire, they're all down on their knees, oh please, oh please, whatever, we'll do whatever, give us your money, billionaire. That's all it becomes is, you know, who has the money can start to buy elections, and that's how it is in a uh, uh, democracy. And civilization really is a time preference for longer time, meaning you'll, you give up short-term gains for longer terms. But if it's a democracy, you're just gonna do things that are gonna benefit you short-term. And it's kind of like a corporation, for example. If you're the CEO and you only care about your short-term uh, bonus, you will may eliminate like R&E, research and development, in order to get your stock price up so you can get your bigger bonus. Even though it may kill the company like 10 years down the road, what do you care? You got your big bonus, you're retired. And that's the thing with democracy is that it's very short-term focus. It doesn't matter if it'll destroy the country long-term. That's why the whole thing with open borders, why do you think they do it? That you think these guys that run these corporations, really, do you think they're stupid and they don't understand it's gonna destroy this nation? They understand it. I'll tell you exactly what they say, because I've talked to them. They said, hey, Ramsey Paul, I, I understand, I agree with you, this is horrible, it's gonna destroy a nation. But if I don't do it, someone else will. So I might as well do it and get my big bonus out of it, and we can get the low you know, cost labor in. So that's the reason, that's democracy. And that's what happens in a democracy. So rejection of the democracy, the founding fathers, I won't read all the quotes you guys know, they were really scared about democracy. And they really attempted in the Constitution to limit it, uh, the, the democracy. The Constitution, like I think Derbyshire said earlier, it's just a piece of paper. I mean, you can be ignored. If you get the Supreme Court judges that say, to blow that off, it doesn't matter. And that's what eventually will happen. And, and again, because the, the founders, they really had like a progressive theology, meaning you, you wouldn't think it by today's standard, you think, well, they're real conservative, but they still believe in the Jefferson, right? We believe all men are equ created equal. And yeah, I know he meant just white men, but still, even among white men, that's not true, right? But he said that, and that was their thinking and their e democracy. So that leads us to the problem. I used to be a libertarianism. I, I, the problem I have with that is I, they can't really present a realistic picture in the world where they win the battle and it stays won because eventually it will always go back into the same thing. Because we humans, um, most of us are, I'm not really social, but most people, like normal people like you guys, you have friends and you're social and people naturally have hierarchies and hierarchies are good and having organizations are good because it gets rid of the kind of some of the weirdos and the strange behavior when you can have an organization and control that. So that's a good thing with um, uh, having, not having libertarianism or anarchy. A monarchy, the good thing about the monarchy is they can provide for the long-term uh, future of the realm, just not the short term, because they're not, theoretically, they're not as controlled by money or stuff like that, so they can look for the long term for the health of the people. And I know we think, oh, monarchy, there's so much tyranny and so forth, but if you even look at the American colonies, how much like King George's influence he had uh, on us was like none, really, compared to the federal government in Washington and democracy. They were like totally free compared to back then. And in general, kings are like, you know, whatever, as long as you don't try to overthrow them, they're, they're fine with it and they let you do your thing. And this is, was a funny thing I, I read about, because you ever read that, and I, I felt bad about this. This is one of the things I felt bad about. <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, you have the Bible, Holy Bible. I'm not insulting the Bible, because I'm a Christian. But when I got older, even when I was a kid, I was like, but you know, I like it, but it's kind of poorly written. And it's, it's like, that's heretical, you probably shouldn't say that. Same thing with the Declaration of Independence. When you read it, it's like, you know, they did the, yeah, all men are created equal, blah, blah, blah. Then it had a, a, a bunch of bitching about the king, basically, right? And one of the things they complained about, there were swarms of officers to harass our people or eat our outer substance. <laughs> I didn't know this, but I uh, should link to it on my website. There's a guy that did a rebuttal back then during the current times, and he said, what are you talking about? Swarms of officers, tax officers. We have like 30 or 40. There's 3 million of you. Is that a swarm? And so we just threw a whole bunch of stuff about, and you're making the Indians mad at us and this and that. So it was, it was kind of exaggerated, the whole American Revolution. And even the most eccentric kings, like Joffrey, but he's kind of not real, but even the most eccentric kings, they kind of left you alone, you know, unless you were their wife or something, that could be. But yeah, otherwise you're okay. And the aristocracy and the people, they helped to protect the niche, uh, nation. And in Hungary, I, I saw like um, King Stephen, and he was at the year eight, 1000 AD, and 
uh, the guy from Hungary can help me uh, make sure that was correct. And it's kind of weird because they still have his hand, literally mummified. And you go in the church and you can pay like 50 cents and they light up and you can look at his hand. It's kind of weird, but he was their king that uh, united the kingdoms, uh, the people of Hungary. So, and he was able to protect them. Okay, hierarchy is natural and, and, and good. Uh, one of the things that the near reactionary is kind of a form of idolatry, believe that you can believe in your own reason alone, that we need to be connected to groups and so forth. I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, I'm a real egotist thinking, man, I know everything on my own, but you know, when you're with a group, you can understand you need to be plugged in. And that was the whole thing that used to be God, government, church, man, woman, child. That was a hierarchy, proper hierarchy. And um, when I was in Eastern Europe, I was talking to the girl, and she said, yeah, you know, you could talk about that, and I agree, you know, it should be God, man, woman, and child, but the trouble is a lot of, you know, she says, a lot of you white nationalists, you get confused with that, you're like, yeah, man and woman, but even within man, it's not the same, it's not the same hierarchy, there's a natural hierarchy, and you shouldn't look at that, even, you know, among white men, so hierarchies are not necessarily a bad thing, and just as women are not equal to men, men aren't equal to each other, that's the concept of that. All right, this is the question. <laughs> when I first started to write, or do video, when I was years ago, when I first started to write, one of the first things I was worried about writing, and the, 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 this teacher taught me, the worst thing that can ever happen is this question, right? You do the whole essay, and then someone's like, yeah, so what? You know, that's, that's devastating. You, you always have to have a reason for why you do something. Because I remember writers, they could be beautiful and paint a pretty picture and all that, but it's like, yeah, so what? You know, you don't really care about it. So it's better to be interesting. Even if you can't write, that's why God made editors. So the so what is to understand that the progressive movement that we really see is primarily religious. I, I think it, it, it doesn't have God. They reject a God and they hate Christianity and traditional religions, but that's where it came from. So we're kind of all Puritans and hippies now. That's where it really came from. And you can't defeat progressivism by advocating a lesser form of progressivism. Because even if you tried, right, let's say if you want to say, oh, we're going to start our own ethno state and white people only, and we'll just have men have the vote, and we'll put it somewhere. Well, eventually it's going to go to the left, and then people are going to buy, and there's going to be pressure. We're going to be right back where we are, because that's how it works. Because if you buy the premise, you buy the religion, you're always going to head to the left. And so if you're going to make um, a progress, you got to reject the whole idea of democracy and uh, equality, which is, I know, like total heresy. I might be struck down now by God, but that is what you need to do. And uh, to understand that hierarchy is good and natural, and you can't just always be a lone wolf. That's kind of destructive to the movement. Um, okay, questions and answers. I believe that monotheism itself is a kind of grounding or or theology for universalism and, and, and therefore equality and, and so on and so forth. And that I guess a follow up would be as, as we see a, a, a gradual loss of faith in Christianity in the, in the Occident, um, do you think we might even kind of have a chance to maybe overcome monotheism? And in that sense, you know, the, the dialectical process we've been living through is going to kind of turn on its head, that people start to appreciate different different races and peoples as having their own spirit and their own destiny and their own gods, effectively. And so, in, in some ways, this long dialectical process, which we're witnessing, where Christianity has very little sovereignty, in a way, in the world, we might actually come out the other end of it uh, into a, a kind of new world, where the newer things are possible and a more traditional outlook is possible. Uh, no. Uh, I, I think religion, I'm not anti-religion, I think it has a place of the hierarchy, so, um, yeah, no. Yes? Oh, do you, do you think it's possible to move past democracy in this age? In this sense, I say it like this, like, everybody can vote today. And it's like, how are you going to tell the masses of people, like, even though it's an illusion, you have no longer have power? You no longer have vote, even though they're told that since they're they're born that like, you have power, you have democracy, you have a vote. How do you convince the, in this age that no democracy is bad? How can you how do you convince people that you don't have a vote and that you don't have power, even though you're told constantly you do? Yeah, and I don't think you really convince people that this is just a natural progression. And I think once you know we get to the zombie apocalypse, and then it's kind of a reboot. And this is the type of thing to look for is you know then you you have a different alternate system. And I don't know if it's a monarchy or whatever. And 
Would you speak to the possibilities of polygamy as a solution? No, I, I think one wife's enough, really. So. Oh, yeah. I, I feel like Oprah. <laughs> Matt, what do you feel about this? <laughs> Please well, share with us. <laughs> share my feelings. Um, well, my, my question would be, given you use the example of the Soviet Union in which from the fall of the Soviet Union, where one out of six Russians considered themselves Orthodox Christians, and now we're looking at polls at three-fourths uh, or Orthodox Christians, and that spiritual revival has led to, I think all of us would agree, that Russia is really the standard bearer for traditionalism. So do you see in terms of Russia being an example for us where eventually when the system collapses, that a spiritual revival will lead us towards traditionalism, traditional gender roles, and a hierarchical society that's healthy? Yeah, I do, and I think in the younger generation, like yourself, is you know becoming more of the orthodox and so forth. So I, I see that could be happening. And my time's up. Okay, one more question. Okay, let's take a vote. Who should get the? Oh, that's democracy. Is this close? It's easier. Um. <laughs> this is your chance. Okay. Uh, is justice a viable uh, goal or uh, uh, a viable uh, uh, a goal, I guess, uh, is a good way. Uh, and, and what institutional arrangements would be required? Yeah, I think justice is a viable goal. And I, and I support courts and all of the traditional law, constitutions, and so all that type of stuff. Uh, the question is, is if you can do it within a democracy or a current uh, theology of all men are equal in democracy. I don't really see that. So, uh, but yeah, justice should be the, uh, a goal. And I think that's my last question. I'm allowed. Otherwise, I get in trouble. I don't want to get in trouble with Jared. So, I I don't know because I really like Derbyshire. He's like, no, I can't. He's the boss, and I believe in hierarchy, right? And he's, he's like the he's he sits on the Iron Throne of Amran. Give me that thing. Yes, a good round of applause for Ramsey Paul. <laughs>